I'm Phil Brink, the consulting coordinator of Colorado Cattlemen's Ag Water Network. And the topic of today's webinar is easements and right-of-ways for water delivery structures. So our presenters are Sarah Dunn. Sarah is an attorney with Balcom and Green Law Firm, specializing in water and real estate. And we have Craig Ullman. Craig is a water resource engineer and president of Applegate Group. And we have Brandon Eflin, a water resource engineer with Summit Engineering. And I should also note that Sarah, Craig, and Brandon also all serve on the Ditch and Reservoir Company Alliance, that's DARCA, Board of Directors. So today's webinar is being recorded, and we will be posting the recording on our website at agwaternetwork.org as soon as that is available. And I will also be accompanying that with highlights. Um, that's kind of a one-page summary of the main points that our speakers made. So look for that, and I'll send out an announcement on, the, on that when it's available. If you have questions for our speakers, you can go ahead and type those into the chat box whenever you want. That's at the lower right of your screen, and we will get to as many of those as we can after their presentation. So we can go ahead, Sarah. Um, Brandon, if you want to start sharing your slide. Our speakers are going to be talking about what Colorado law says about water conveyance easements and right-of-ways and what water right holders and water delivery consortiums can do about common challenges that are becoming more and more common, unfortunately, blocked access, uh, adjacent landowner complaints, trespass, and many other related issues. So if you guys are ready, Sarah, Craig, and Brandon, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Phil. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Craig real quick to give you a quick introduction of what DARCA does, and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation. Yeah, so real quick, DARCA was an organization formed, um, I believe over 20 years ago. There was a recognized need in the water community as far as ditches go to share, get together, share information, what's going on in various basins, because frequently, I mean, still today, I mean, there's there's ditches that are almost right next to each other that don't really talk to each other. You know, everyone that's working on these small ditches in particular, they're they're busy. They don't have time to coordinate with others. And so DARCA was kind of formed trying to bring them together, not just to share information, but also to discuss solutions to common problems that everyone's facing and just provide a good avenue to update um, people um, in the ditch community as to what's going on at the state level, new legislation that could impact them. And so uh, the one thing DARCA currently does is we do have a conference that's coming up in November on the front range area this year. We try to move it around the state, but that's where we, we try to gather people together uh, to share information such as we're going to present today, but among other things as far as what's going on around the state in regards to ditches. So... All right, uh, next slide. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna provide you kind of a background, make sure that everyone understands what we're talking about as far as easements, how they compare to other interests in property, how Colorado has changed um, in the last 20 years about how Colorado courts view easements and statutory changes. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Craig and Brandon to talk about some real world challenges. Um, I know I deal with easements in my practice every single day. I think with the increase of urbanization along our ditches and the easements we're talking about today are really specific to water conveyance and water diversion. Not so much about, you know, like hunting, fishing or, you know, road easements, that type of thing. Um, but I deal with those every day in my practice. It seems like we're having more and more conflicts. Uh, part of it is that we have had an influx of individuals buying property along water conveyance structures that are not you know, originally from the West and they may not totally understand. So an easement is really just an interest in property that allows you to enter upon land owned by another person for a very specific purpose. And so it can be created through an express grant, like with a deeded easement by prescription or by necessity. And it's a bit benefit to the easement holder and it's always a burden to the underlying landowner. Um, the easement is referred to as the dominant estate owner and the underlying land is the servient estate owner. 
we're probably going to refer to it as the easement owner, the underlying landowner benefited and burdened rather than using those technical terms. But as you dig into documents and such, you may see it referred to as dominant estate and the underlying landowner is the Serbian estate. Okay, next. So deeded easement can also be referred to as express easements. I run into these most frequently in my practice after there's already been a dispute really regarding a prescriptive easement or if we're creating a new easement, um, a new water conveyance and diversion structure. Um, a deeded, e deeded easement is created through a formal grant. Typically they're recorded so that they will show up in title commitments and anyone owning that land in the future has notice of it. And the privileges and limits of the easement are established by the express terms of the instrument. Um, anytime there's a conflict, I think that this is usually my recommended course. Let's sit down, let's make sure that everyone has a common understanding of the rights and obligations of both the easement owner and the underlying property owner. And the best way to do that is to basically create this contract, um, a, a easement agreement or to do a formal grant of easement in a deed. Okay, next. Alternatively, and this is what we see for probably 90% of water diversions and conveyance structures is prescriptive easements. And prescriptive easements have arisen through adverse possession. Basically, um, the ditch was put in place, it's been operated for 100 years, and there was never anything recorded regarding it. Um, the, the complicated factor in prescriptive easements is everyone's like, well, how big is it? What can I do with it? Um, and there isn't really always an easy answer to that. It depends on what happened historically. Um, the easement by prescription is established when it's open and notorious. It's continued without effective interruption for the prescriptive period. And the use was either adverse or it was pursuant to an attempted but ineffective grant. And so we deal with prescriptive easements the most. Um, and when I talk about in 2015, um, how the law in Colorado was clarified, it was really regarding prescriptive easements. Next slide. Um, in contrast, some ditch and reservoir companies do have fee simple ownership. And so fee simple ownership is the most extensive interest that one may possess in property. It's unconditional ownership with full control of the land. So that means that whoever owns that water diversion and conveyance structure, if they have it in fee simple ownership, they own uh, not just the water ride, but the land below, anything that's burdened by that conveyance document. So on one end of the spectrum, we have the fee simple ownership. In the middle of the spectrum, we have the easements. And then at the other end of the spectrum, next slide, we have licenses. And when I was studying licenses in law school, my professor compared it to like a movie ticket. It's a personal property. Uh, personal privilege. It's not a property interest. And so it's like being able to go into a movie theater, watch the movie. At the end of the movie, they want you off. Licenses, it, it doesn't include the ownership interest in real property like an easement or fee simple does. It's a personal privilege that can be revoked at any time. I run into this when someone is trying to create an easement through adverse possession, a prescriptive easement, and I'm representing the underlying landowner. And we say, well, we don't really want them to have that. So we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll give them permission to come upon the property for this very specific purpose. This is a license and then we can revoke it. So it doesn't, it doesn't follow with the land. Um, there is one caveat to that. And that is that if the individual that holds that license invests money or labor, then it may become, the court may deem it irrevocable because it would then become a license coupled with an interest in land. So if you're trying to limit someone's use um, by granting them permission, by granting them a license, understand that it may not always be revocable if they have significant investments. Next. Okay. So Colorado uses a balancing test between the Eastman owner and the underlying landowner. And really before 2015, um, it was very difficult for underlying landowners to know what they could and could not do. Um, we didn't have a formal process for someone to come in, um, an underlying landowner, and modify a ditch. Um, this changed due to a controversy that actually arose in the Roaring Fork Valley near Basalt, where the Roaring Fork Club, which has a golf course, um, went in and modified a ditch without the permission of the ditch owners. 
Um, they piped a bunch of portions. They put some tea boxes in on top of what used to be the ditch, which is now a pipeline um, without consent. And so it went through a number, it went through the district court and then up to the Supreme Court. And I think it might've gone back again. Um, but in the end, what the Supreme Court did is they adopted the recommendations from what we call the restatement third of property, which is an accommodation doctrine. And that seeks to balance the rights and the interests of the burdened and the benefited property owners. So the owner of the easement and the underlying property owner by providing a framework in which the underlying property owner can make reasonable changes to the location or dimensions of an easement to facilitate the normal use of their property. And so it, it provided rules and remedies which the parties can, instead of the parties taking unilateral action to relocate the ditch without consent. And this is now the settled law governing relocation of easements in Colorado. Um, so how this goes into practice, if you represent an underlying um, property owner or you are an underlying property owner and you wanna make a change to your property, you're going to develop some housing units. And so you need to put a road in. So now you need to put a culvert in the ditch. Um, you would go and ask the owner of that easement, the water right owner, the ditch owner, if, if you can make that modification to them. If they just say, nope, you can't, then you have to go to court and you have to prove there's a three-part test that you have to satisfy in order to make that improvement. Um, next slide. That's here at the bottom of the page. You have, to end, you have to prove to the court that it does not significantly lessen the utility of the easement, that it does not increase the burdens on the owner of the easement in its use and enjoyment, and it doesn't frustrate the purpose for which the easement was created. Um, an easier way to understand it is to say that it's not going to create more work for that ditch owner, that it's going to continue to deliver water in the same time and amount. So for instance, if you're going to put it in a pipe and that creates a new maintenance obligation because the pipe can get plugged with trash, you as the underlying landowner may be obligated with installing a trash rack. You may have to either pay for or monitor that trash rack yourself so that you're not creating an additional burden for that ditch owner. Um, if you can prove that you can do that, then the court is going to allow you to make that modification to install that pipeline or that culvert, even if the ditch owner is an in full agreement. Next slide. Um, another issue that we ran into, and this kind of developed on after that 2015 court decision. Um, in 2019, uh, there were a couple of ditches that went in and tried to get some, some federal financing in order to make improvements to their ditch, either through piping it or through cementing the ditch. And they were unsuccessful in that funding because it wasn't clear under the law whether the, they had the right to go in and make those modifications. And the underlying landowners had objected and opposed that funding. Um, so the conservation districts were really, um, they were kind of, they spearheaded the effort through the legislature to get a bill that clarified. And that was House Bill 191082. And that what that bill says is that as long as it's not inconsistent, with an express grant of easement, that an easement for water conveyance also includes these additional rights, the ability to construct the ditch, to operate the ditch, to clean the ditch, to maintain, repair, and replace, and also to make these efficiency improvements, um, which is lining and piping of the ditch. So this was really beneficial uh, for ditch owners because it allowed them to go in and, and get financing that they needed in order to make these modifications. And it was one step beyond, I think, what that 2015 court case did in that it made a very clear statutory right um, to be able to enter upon the property for these. It doesn't require this um, House Bill 191082 does not require an express easement, but it applies equally whether you're operating under an easement by necessity, a prescriptive easement, or an express easement, as long as it's not inconsistent with the terms of that express easement. Uh, next slide. Okay, I think this is where I hand it off. And in, in Craig, I was going to go back one slide and just mention something to this slide that Sarah presented is that I think the one of the important parts that this, uh, one of the conflict areas that this House bill seemed to uh, um, make clearer was, of course, as an underlying landowner, you might see uh, uh, what appears to be a natural ditch, earthen ditch, to be an amenity or a, uh, a visual um, 
amenity to your property and at times the ditch companies for reasons of you know excessive seepage and, and other maintenance reasons one into either concrete line or in some cases even enclosed via pipe or or other mechanism and this allows for those ditch companies to go ahead and do that if it's needed for maintenance reasons um, and, and does not allow the landowner to object to that. Yeah, and I'll actually comment just a little bit further on that. We do actually have one project right now on the Western Slope that where a couple landowners are challenging our, our the ditch company's uh, pipeline across their property. Now there's more nuances that, to the case than just the, the pipe, but um, it will be interesting to see where that goes. Um, but um, as far as protecting the easements and rights away, you know, as engineers, we're frequently advising our clients on on how to do such a thing. I mean, one thing that you can do that really would help is just maintaining a regular presence on the ditch. You know, some ditches, um, people are out there daily checking it or maybe every other day. There's others where maybe it's twice a year, you know. The, the problem with that is, is you do get, like Brandon was saying, some of the new landowners start to they, they don't see someone out there they don't even maybe realize that it's a natural or that it's a man-made feature and so when someone comes through after several years to do some cleaning with a track hoe it's it's quite a shock so if you can just maintain a, a regular presence walking the ditch cleaning trash out of the ditch you're gonna be seen by the landowners and such along there and they'll be used to to the presence of someone else on the easement um, and that goes with engaging the landowners. You know, if you if you have a new landowner, try to try to get in touch with them and just make sure that they're aware of the presence of the ditch and that they can expect to see ditch personnel possibly on the ditch periodically. Um, and just cover, you know, do do your routine maintenance, clean the ditch, you know, try to maintain the vegetation on the ditch. If if it is let go, it's not only more expensive to deal with after 20 years of growth of trees and willows, but it's also more onerous as far as um, the impact of the property and the visual impact of the landowners. They've, they've grown used to possibly, you know, seeing more vegetation along the canal. And so then when it's removed, it's more of a challenge as well from a just relationship with the landowner. Um, another good one is to require crossing and licensing agreements. You know. You, if you're an owner of a ditch, you have this long um, linear feature, and obviously there's going to be utilities and driveways and things that have to cross that in the future, especially as parcels get divided up further and further. Um, you don't want to have, as a ditch owner, your maintenance increase, you know, by where there used to be two culverts on the ditch. Now there's 20 driveways and each one has a culvert. Requiring licensing agreements for those types of crossings and utilities crossings helps uh, relieve the ditch company from the maintenance of those in the future. It clarifies, you know, who's going to be responsible for replacement should these, you know, in the future when the pipes or whatever it is, the crossing starts to have issues. If there's, you know, a utility perpendicularly crosses the ditch with something, they're going to disturb the ditch bank and making sure that, that ditch bank is repaired properly. That's another thing that we really encourage ditch companies to do. And a lot of small ditch companies are still not used to this and don't maybe implement this they don't understand that they they do have a right to require some sort of agreement with the entity that's trying to cross their ditch. Um, another one that we encourage is fencing and signage, um, obviously where it's appropriate, but there's, I think as Sarah mentioned, you know, the, the right of way or the easement for the ditch company is for ditch purposes. It's not for other purposes, but it's frequent that the public can start to see these as great hiking trails and, you know, places to walk the dog and things. And your your easement technically does not allow for that. Your, the easement through these, all these, you go through tons of landowners up and down the ditch. It's It's not it was never decreed or given to you as a right for uh, you know other people to use. It's strictly for the operation and maintenance of the ditch itself. So fencing, just saying, you know, this, you know, no, no trespassing property of X and X ditch company is appropriate. Major at major access points or maybe road crossings. Um, fencing is another one that can go a long way. Is just putting a gate on the ditch where it maybe crosses a county road or something, so you don't get too much traffic up and down the ditch. And just, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead, I, was, 
I was just going to mention the the license agreements. The, uh, you know, I, we I encourage a lot of the the ditch companies that I represent to get these, even for the the simple simple utility crossings that may appear not to be very uh, present much disturbance to the ditch company or conflict. It, it's and it's not meant to be punitive. It's really meant for the ditch company to understand where they do have uh, crossings and encroachments. And it's, it really set, it's that vehicle that sets forth the responsibilities of both the ditch company, the easement holder, and then the crossing applicant. Um, and generally, the applicant agrees to reimburse both for the legal and the engineering review of, yeah. the, of the easement holder, the ditch company, um, and uh, really allows the ditch company to understand whether or not that the proposed um, modification meets that threshold of St. Jude's and, and, and ensures that any any burdens that are going to be placed on the ditch company um, are, are uh, covered by the agreement um, and or some fee associated with it. Yeah, and I no. think, I mean, that even goes so far as, I mean, board crossings, some people will think, oh, well, it's not a big deal because they're going to bore under the ditch. So they don't really need a crossing agreement. Well, there's, there still can be potential risk. And just like you said, knowledge of the crossing for the, on the ditch company's behalf so that they know that there's a utility crossing them at that point. And things like how, well, how deep are you boring beneath the ditch? Are you doing it during irrigation season? In which case there is possibly a risk um, with, you know, water traveling along the, the board path. So, I mean, there's, there's still things to consider, even though they're not physically touching the ditch itself. So that's right, Craig. I usually try to make the uh, applicant understand that it's also for their, um, their benefit that the ditch company is aware of, of where the crossing is, how deep it is, and to understand if uh, that normal maintenance, you know, is not going to have a conflict with that utility. So really it allows a ditch company, you know, the ability not to potentially damage that in the future. So it's 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 a benefit to both parties. Yep. So next slide. So some examples of unapproved encroachments. I mean, these two photos here just kind of show some examples. You know, you start to get where you get property that's getting subdivided and people on both sides of the canal. It's common to see pedestrian bridges crop up or ATV bridges crop up and Keeping track of those and getting permission for those is still kind of important. You're, you know, you now have, let's say, kids walking across that, you know, and are they, is there a safety risk there? There's, there's a lot to consider. Also, this other picture in the lower corner, this is an example of a ditch that did not maintain very good presence on the canal. And before they knew it, there was a pretty much a, a building that is right you you can no longer drive on the canal and since you can't drive the canal anymore the trees are growing up and in that photo the ditch is actually there just on the left side of the photo but you can see the building foundation is about two feet from the edge of the water so i mean this is one now this ditch company can't drive through there and it was let go long enough that um, they would have a hard time probably moving the building out of the way but they can't drive even an atv through there now so um some simple ways of just dealing with landowners is I always encourage at least our clients, if you have an issue to start a verbal conversation with the landowner first, if you can, um, versus going straight to an attorney letter or something like that. Um, frequently that can resolve a lot of your issues, educating them with, you know, on Colorado water law, because frequently, I think as Sarah mentioned, a lot of the conflicts we have over here are from landowners who aren't from Colorado. They don't have, you know, a, even a concept of an irrigation ditch really. And they don't know that, you know, how strongly the Colorado constitution, you know, protects ditches and their rights to carry water across people's properties. So just some of that basic education could go a long ways. If you get a persistent landowner that is continuing to be an issue, then maybe just a letter from your ditch company on why the easement's there and explaining, you know, what your need is to access that easement um, and how maybe they're negatively impacting your ability to, to carry out your normal maintenance activities. If necessary, this always does come up at some point, is getting your attorney involved and helping to enforce your rights to your, um, your easement. And then, of course, no one ever wants to go there, but legal action, you know, with possible recovery of legal fees could be a final step. But 
Craig, I was just going to highlight that the, the, you've already mentioned the, the manners and the ways in which you can uh, protect your easement and why we encourage our, our, our clients to diligently um, you know, patrol and protect that easement is once these encroachments occur, as you can imagine, they're much tougher uh, to work back from um, the upper right picture is uh, in, in the city of Boulder. And the city of Boulder, unfortunately, is an example of many miles of ditch that were development um, had, has occurred and encroached significantly on the ditch. And the, the work and the education it takes to go try to reestablish that easement um, to allow for, you know, maintenance. Um, this happens to be an example of what I'm working on a project that is just to reestablish a walking path along the ditch, not a vehicle or, or equipment access, just simply to allow the ditch company to get back in there and lay eyes on it uh, via foot. And uh, as you can imagine, it's been difficult to educate landowners who have now fences uh, right up against the, the, the ditch and now have played also, as you can see, placed pedestrian bridges that allow them access to the other side of, uh, other side of the property. Um, the, the ditch company in this case is, is seeking uh, license agreements with each individual uh, bridge crosser um, again, not to be punitive, they're going to allow them to uh, put those back in. But again, uh, it sets forth that responsibility. In this case, the ditch company is saying that bridge can be there, but the event of an emergency that the ditch company needs to get in there with equipment and needs to be able to access that. If they have to remove that bridge, the ditch company has the right to do that, uh, not responsible for damages to the bridge in doing that. And that's the, uh, the bridge owner's responsibility to replace it. The bridge after it's it's been removed um, and i'll say real quick there's there's questions coming on the chat and i think yeah. well our, our plan is to address those at the, the end of the presentation so we'll, we will get back to those we're not ignoring them so so craig i'll take this slide this slide is really kind of a summary of, of what him and i have both mentioned in the previous slides that we do again uh, encourage our easement holders to seek license and crossing agreements with uh, um, encroachers, um, utility crossings, um, developments, et cetera, that seek to modify or encroach on the on the easement. Um, and as part of that, you know, the agreements need to explicitly outline then who's responsible for for the. Uh, quote unquote improvements to the ditch or modification to the ditch after uh, those are done. Uh, Sarah mentioned this. One of the things that we uh, commonly see on the front range is rather than the, the ditch company wanting to line or pipe, it's more often the underlying landowner who's who's bought a piece of property that has a a ditch that um, crosses the property and for the sake of, of developable development and, and increasing developable area, they oftentimes want to realign the ditch and at the same time, oftentimes enclose it. Um, as you can imagine, these ditch companies who have maintained these ditches via tractor, burning, et cetera, for, for uh, 100 plus years do not have the, the ability to maintain uh, a couple thousand feet of, of pipe and manholes. So, in, in for that matter, having the, the ability to repair, replace that in the event that that's needed. So uh, if the ditch company as part of the license agreement uh, agrees to allow the underlying landowner to modify the ditch, uh, oftentimes they're assigning that perpetual repair and replace and maintenance of that improvement um, and take that off of the, the ditch company's responsibilities being it's a, a significant modification to what they have done historically. Um, uh, again, some of the minor things that, that are set forth in minor, but important that are set forth in these agreements is the construction windows. Obviously a lot of this work can't be done during the irrigation season it needs to be done, uh, outside of that, um, the agreement would, would identify and define that, uh, provides remedies for construction mishaps, um, as Sarah mentioned, one of the things that often occurs with the realignment of the ditches, they're, they're modifying what was historically a prescriptive easement. We would advise our clients to get a deeded easement uh, 
along with that relocation. So it really does define and record uh, that easement so that off the successors of the developer generally is what it is, HOAs, metro, dis metro districts, et cetera, uh, have a document that they can refer to and understand that the ditch company ha does have a deeded and recorded easement through the property. Uh, and that's kind of set in stone, if you will. Uh, the license agreement awful, oftentimes then becomes, we, we, we attach the construction plans to that document and it becomes a good reference document down the road for, for uh, other generations or as turnover occurs that uh, people understand what it is that occurred and whose responsibility is it to, mon uh, to maintain those improvements. Um, one of the good things, at least on the front range, is most reviewing agencies now require, whether it be the city or county planners, uh, require that uh, uh, an applicant, if in their process they determine that it's going to require a modification or an encroachment on the ditch company, the, the reviewing agency will uh, uh, require the applicant to seek ditch company review and approval. So it's good to have a... a uh, um, a presence and a uh, um, agreement with those reviewing agencies such that they do point them in the in the direction of the easement holder so that uh, you're ensured that you have a chance to review that. Um, as Craig mentioned, we we encourage that all crossings, whether they be above head or below below grade, um, be subject to license agreements. Again, not to be in a punitive manner or a money making venture by the ditch company, but more to allow the ditch company to understand uh, where these crossings occur and to be able to assign responsibility if, if needed. Some of the issues that we see with urbanization beyond just simply, uh, you know, crossings or physical crossings is, is, is drainage related. Um, and uh, oftentimes applicants want to, uh, I see it all the time, put, uh, drain their detention ponds. So they're required to, by the city, to uh, detain historical or detained, detain developed flows and release that at a historical rate. Oftentimes a, a ditch happens to be the convenient uh, receptacle for that storm, storm flow. And uh, some ditch companies allow for that, some don't. Uh, some of the things that we do see that are problematic with that, of course, is uh, water quality is becoming a bigger issue. Uh, whether or not ditch has adequate capacity to, to accept that that storm, additional storm drainage, some developers and their engineers are shrewd enough to point out that you know this flow flow, if detained at historical rate, uh, was subject to draining into the ditch prior to development. Um, there's a number of issues that I would. Take, take with that approach, one of which, of course, is water quality, which I mentioned. And also what's my first little bullet there is sheet, flow, sheet flow versus point flow. And sheet flow is essentially how that water would have in a non-point source manner uh, flowed across the uh, probably vegetated to some extent property and, and, and flow into the ditch and how that's different than a point discharge that comes directly out of a pipe from a detention pond, how that can be problematic um, for the ditch, for the ditches, downstream ditches. Uh, other urbanization issues, there, there are many. Um, encroachment uh, obviously is, is one that um, is problematic. Uh, developers are becoming more and more aware of the ditch company uh, rights and uh, rights and um, most of the time reach out to the ditch companies in advance of them proposing things. Uh, one of the things that becomes problematic to ditches, at least on the front range, is that the, the encroachment or at least the urbanized development surrounding the, the ditch precludes the ditch companies from being able to maintain the ditch how they had historically one of those methods that becomes uh, apparent is burning, uh, and some of the things that have gone on in the in the front range the last few years, um, people are much more uh, uh, aware and uh, um, of what burning can do. Increased, I think Craig mentioned, it, increased pedestrian traffic. That's a big issue for the ditch companies. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure that's been in place for 100 plus years uh can be dangerous 
And of course, with increased dog and pedestrian traffic, uh, there has, you know, trying to limit liability associated with those. I mentioned relocation um, and the fact that we uh, generally ask that they provide, the developer provide a deeded easement. Uh, one of the things I like to point out to uh, the ditch companies are reviewing on behalf of is there are some pros and cons between a prescriptive easement and a deeded easement. Of course, a deeded easement uh, provides that uh, definite and refer referenceable uh, document that sets forth that easement. But at the same time, it's oftentimes surveyed and described so that in the future, when you do need to uh, uh, use that easement, it is defined it um, in versus a prescriptive easement that just generally provides that with what is reasonable to be able to maintain that ditch meaning that uh, you better be sure if you're going to give up a prescriptive easement for a deeded easement you better be sure that you can accomplish all of those activity activities that you need to do within that easement once it's defined it's not as easy as saying well i had a prescriptive easement that allowed me to access the property from this other location, you now are tied to that deeded easement. Um, and so it's always a cautionary uh, tale there. Um, in closing and piping, I mentioned some of the issues with, uh, with that, the additional and the change to the maintenance. Um, oftentimes those pipes need to be jet jetted and backed to maintain rather than being able to pull that with a backhoe and or burn the ditch. Um, and that's oftentimes why you assign that responsibility to the developer and, it, and, it, and its successors. Um, repair and perpetual repair and replace, I've mentioned. Uh, the other thing now is that the state has, has put uh, the responsibility of uh, locates. Uh, the ditches are now identified as a utility and therefore responsible for responding to 811 um, uh, utility locate uh, requests, and now that uh, if you're, uh, you are you have a, a ditch that gets put in a, a thousand foot long uh, pipe, um, you now are responsible to do that. I mentioned that because it's also become something that as part of these license agreements, we try to assign to the developer and then its successors, HOA, Metro District. Um, so they're now responsible for responding to those, those requests. And with that, I think we are ready for questions. Okay. Sarah or Craig, did you have anything to add to my my long winded last few slides? No, I don't have anything. And if you want, I have a pretty good record. You know, I could sometimes they read the questions, but I think I've got a pretty good record of what they are. And maybe okay. I just go through those real quick and then we can review them at the end to make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, one of the questions asked for clarification of what we're referring to as a ditch company. And I think we should make clear that, you know, the rights and obligations that we've identified herein um, apply equally to a ditch company that is like an incorporated mutual ditch company, as well as just an individually owned ditch. And so we deal a lot with ditch companies. That's why we reference that. But, you know, an individual owner that has an easement for a ditch would have that same rights and responsibilities and could also require crossing agreements and um, those licenses that we were talking about. Um, another question came up on, does this apply in state and federal lands? Um, as far as like what the easements and the licenses and stuff, and my experience has been with state and federal lands, that they will only recognize an easement if that ditch predated the creation of that state or federal interest. So if your ditch was in place in 1880 and then that land became forest service land in 1890, they typically will recognize a ditch easement for that ditch. Otherwise they require you to come in and obtain a special use permit. And that special use permit is what we refer to as a license. And so they put terms and conditions on how you can operate and maintain the ditch on the public lands. Um, but so the easements are only recognized typically when it predates the creation of that federal interest or state interest. Otherwise, they require special use permits. Um, another question was, how, how does that work with CDOT or highways? And I haven't come across that. I didn't know if maybe Craig or Brandon came across 
um, a ditch crossing on a highway or or a new road that was coming in. Every every uh, example that I've had, CDOT has generally been good about recognizing uh, the prescriptive easement of the ditch and grants that easement. Um, uh, there are some entities that don't allow easements through right away. Um, and I don't recall if CDOT grants a license, license as a utility license rather than a, an easement um, through a right of way. I know some towns like to hand and cities like to handle it that way, where they're grant, granting a utility license rather than an easement through their right of way. Generally, provides the ditch company similar protection as an easement would. Um, oftentimes what I found is that when an entity won't grant an easement through a right of way uh, or recognize that easement through a right of way, they oftentimes accept responsibility for the maintenance and repair and replace for any infrastructure within that right of way. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, frequently the ditch predates a lot of CDOT's infrastructure. I mean, most of the ditches are over 100 years old and the highways are less so. Um, I've never been in a situation where it was honestly the other way around. And so usually the ditch owner is usually kind of the senior mm -hmm. easement holder where those two are going to cross. And but like Brandon said, CDOT's usually been very easy to work with on the few instances that we've been involved with. So. And we got another follow-up question on that. Is that the same for county roads? And actually that is different in Colorado, that there is a statute, it was interpreted in a case out of Southwestern Colorado, that if the county comes in and culverts a ditch, um, that it's then, or puts a bridge in, that it's then the county's obligation to operate and maintain that crossing. Um, you know, typically a ditch company and the county will work together. You know, they might, the ditch company might buy the pipe and the county road and bridge would provide the equipment. But really the, the cost of that crossing, because it's a public safety issue for the county by statute in Colorado is imposed on the county. Um, I've seen a couple of counties um, that are now trying to shift that to the ditch owner by creating a crossing agreement, not a crossing agreement, that then, you know, that, that is crossing the ditch, but actually a crossing agreement for the ditch and the county road. And so when that repair then gets made, a new culvert gets put in, there has to be an agreement at that time that then the ditch company is responsible for maintaining that. So that's a little bit different. Um, there was a question about the ditch spoils. When a ditch company cleans the ditch, um, whose responsibility is that? Um, Brandon or Craig, do you want to address that? Well, Sarah, I thought you did a good job answering it. We had a similar question come into Darka just recently regarding this. Um, I'll answer it this way. Is generally, the ditch company's historical practice has been to spoil, you know, if they dredge the ditch, uh, clean out the ditch. Oftentimes, that has just gone on the banks of the ditch. Uh, part of the reason why they do claim the width of the easement is for, for that purpose um, I, I think Sarah mentioned that unless that becomes, uh, you know, a significant burden on the underlying landowner for that practice to be that way, I think generally that the easement holder has the right to do that. Um, I think it, uh, in some, the ditch companies I re represent, I think generally um, feel, at least the bigger ones anyway, will uh, take responsibility for removing uh, significant amounts of that. If they have trash racks that collect debris, they will uh, remove that from the trash rack and then take that offsite. They they take that on as uh, as their responsibility. But Sarah, do you think that the easement holder or the ditch company has to uh, remove any dredgings? I know unless it unreasonably interferes with the use of the underlying property. So I think it goes back to that, you know, balancing the interests of the underlying property owner and the ditch owner. Um, I find that a lot of ditch owners are hesitant to begin to haul that stuff off because they don't want to create an, a precedent that they're required to do so. Um, in cases where it is unreasonable and it interferes with the underlying use, I mean, like for the example of that ditch that went through the Roaring Fork Club golf course, if the ditch owner then came in and used a backhoe and piled it, you know, within one of the, you know, the golf courses, 
fairways, then I think that that would be deemed unreasonable. And in that case, they would have to, you know, dispose of that in a different way, or if they were mucking out a pond or something. Um, another question that we've gotten is that if a pipe, if a ditch is piped and these large trees, which we see this all the time, that, that used to be irrigated by the ditch now die, whose responsibility is that? Um, that one really, I think, depends on the facts of that particular circumstance. I would normally advise the ditch owner to work with the landowner on removing those trees um, so that we don't have to litigate liability if it does fall down and hurt someone or damage a structure. If they're within the ditch easement, um, one of some of those pictures that, that Craig and Brandon had of ditches that had not been well maintained that had those trees growing up on the banks, I would say clearly that would be the responsibility of the ditch company to remove those and haul those off. Um, if it's outside the easement, because you know those trees can can depend on that ditch for quite a distance, then that becomes more the underlying landowner's property. But again, I think the best suggestion that, that has been provided today is that the ditch owner and the property owner should start with a verbal conversation. Um, it, you know, when you start with attorneys, it, it doesn't always resolve itself as as quickly. <laughs> Um, we have another question regarding ditch seepage and who and the responsibilities of ditch seepage. And I, I'd like to hear from Craig and Brandon on this. My view of that is that that if it, that if someone comes to, like we saw the structure that was built on the edge of the ditch, and if they're getting seepage in their basement, they really came to the nuisance, right? And so if a ditch is in place and you create a new use in close proximity to the ditch, and then you are damaged due to seepage from the ditch or normal operations from the ditch, then I think the court isn't going to be very sympathetic. And they're going to say that you actually came to the nuisance. Um, that would be true also if you put a secondary ditch below a primary ditch, so you have two ditches running parallel and you had problems with that, that later ditch that came in that was parallel, probably the court would say that you came to the nuisance. Um, however, as a ditch owner, if you are not properly operating your ditch, and you're allowing like rodent holes to come in and you're actually being negligent, then you could be found to be responsible if you're causing damage from that seepage due to your negligence. Yeah, and Sarah, there's one case we, we got preliminarily involved with years ago in Western Colorado, revolved around a ditch and some seepage in a house. Well, the house, the house had been there for almost 100 years and the ditch had been there for probably about 110. So you say, well, OK, the, typically you'd say, well, the, you know, the ditch came first. So the seepage, you know, is it's the house owner's problem. However, in this case, you know, like you just referred to the negligence, there had not been a history of seepage issues with the house below the ditch in the whole 100 years that had been there until the ditch owner sent an inexperienced person out there to clean the ditch on a backhoe and they way over excavated the ditch and tore the seal out of the ditch and created a seepage issue where his at least for the past like 75 years there really hadn't been one and so you got to be a little bit careful there i mean seepage typically is not you know the responsibility of the ditch company to control as long as it's not negligent on behalf of the ditch company i think so yeah i concur with both of you i i do have quite a few uh, examples of uh, homeowners that contact the ditch company complaining that, uh, you know, their, their, their home built in the 2000s, uh, some pump runs all the time. Um, and generally the answer to that is, is it, yes, the ditch company understands that an earthen, earthen ditch is going to see, but just like Sarah and Craig both mentioned, you know, I advise them to the ditch companies that so long as, you know, you're not ne negligent in, in maintaining that ditch, um, you know, it's really not that responsibility of the ditch company. Uh, one of the things that we see that I, we encourage or we try to, like Craig mentioned, trying to educate the surrounding landowners or underlying landowners uh, is that trees uh, present seepage issues, especially after they they die. The roots the roots rot, and what we found is they essentially hollow out and serve as as conduits for seepage out of the ditch. So that's that balancing act of the, the surrounding landowners not wanting the ditch company to remove cottonwood trees that line the ditch. Uh, and we try to, uh, you know, educate that landowner that we're in through the removal of these trees or not allowing these trees to propagate that uh, uh, we're trying to prevent issues for you down the road as well. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I think the one thing that maybe I need to add is that as the ditch owner is going in and you know, kind of cleaning out these spoils and maintaining the trees that you have to do it within your the parameters of your easement, the width of your easement. And so typically you see where they have one side of the ditch where they pile spoils and they might push them down in order to create the road. That's the side that they maintain it from. Um, I, I don't think the court would find it reasonable if someone continues to expand it each time and, you know, want to want to continue to pile it next to and next to and taking up more of that underlying landowner's property. I think that it, it needs to be reasonable and it needs to be for the purposes required, but I don't think that they allow you to just continue to expand it. Um, we had a question of whether there are it, whether there are standard easement widths and whether this is above the ditch, below the ditch, if those vary, is it just based on reasonableness and the historical use? Um, I'll let the engineers talk to that. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, it's it's everyone we run into this all the time with prescriptive easements because there isn't a width every but everyone wants to know what is the width what is a reasonable width and it really it really depends on the ditch itself and the the topography up love and below the ditch and you know the capacity of the ditch all these things factor in so you can't really say well you know for a, a medium-sized ditch 50 feet i mean that that is fairly common but i've seen it larger and i've seen it smaller depending on you know the a case by case basis. Um, when you go to a deeded easement or something, then you are going to get into a defined width. Um, but the prescriptive is typically, like I think Sarah said, it's it's a lot of what is the historic practice. What width has been required to maintain the ditch historically, um, or to accomplish the the purpose of the you know of improvements to the canal you know do we need to get machinery in there just because 100 years ago the ditch was maintained with a horse and a plow or you know something like that doesn't mean that in today's world that you have to continue using a horse and plow well now okay we need maybe we, there is a little bit of what needed now for an excavator to get in there to do the work that maybe uh, you know was hand work in the past but always kind of within reason and yes it leaves a little bit of gray area which some people like and don't like but that is I mean that's just the fact of where it is is there, there is some gray area there as far as what that width is frequently it is offset I noticed there's, there's been a lot of questions on the width like a lot of times the uphill side of the ditch will be smaller than the lower side because the lower side of the ditch includes the canal bank and access road and that's where the, a lot of the spoils will frequently get piled um you have anything to add to that, Brandon? Not really. I, I do try to encourage the ditch companies to, even though they have a prescriptive easement, to somewhat define it so that at least we can begin conversations with with applicants when they come to us. But it is is Craig mentioned that it'd be nice if all ditches, you know, traverse flat ground, but of course they don't. So that is why it is a bit site specific in that if you do have a perch ditch that it's it, or an you know quite a bit of a gradient difference between one side to the other, that there's a predominant side that the ditch company, and that's often pointed out to me, it says, well, you, your ditch road is on one side. And uh, I always state that while the ditch company has, you know, frequently in, in decided to, to access one side for their predominant access and maintenance, that doesn't preclude them from at times having to, the need to go on the other side. So ditch companies generally, I try to rather than, set a, a total width uh, um, centered about the, uh, the the center line of the ditch I try to encourage that we we define it based on a top from a distance from the top of bank and that that really allows for defining that equipment width that would be able to get up and down either side um, it's not uncommon for it to be like I see Travis mentioned slightly different from one side to the other 50 to 75 feet is a is a, a relative you know again depends on the size of the ditch and the in the uh but it's not uncommon for you know a 50 to 75 foot easement at least uh for the ditches that i've been a part of and there is a comment on there too you know do you have the right to an easement beyond where the water comes off the ditch for example laterals um typically most of the ditches i work for they're responsibility ends at the takeout from the ditch. So they are not responsible frequently for the laterals. 
whether there's a lateral company and you know or private owners that are managing the lateral that's a separate issue from the ditch company themselves so there there is still you know the same laws would apply i believe sarah to to those laterals but it's under different ownership it's either just if it's not incorporated it's under the you know the owners who are carrying water in that ditch still have a right to maintain that lateral but it's not the ditch company per se you know they're they're would typically responsibility would typically end where they end responsibility for maintenance. Yeah, and this this also comes up and we had a question of what about unincorporated ditches? And yeah. I think I've lost my camera because we had a little bit of a, a electrical surge here, but um, it, it's much more difficult with an unincorporated ditch because each owner, if there's multiple owners within the ditch, they're co-tenants. So if I was to represent someone wanting a crossing across that ditch, I would probably want to get each one of the owners within that ditch to sign off on it. And so I would go and separately negotiate with each one of them. Um, and so it's helpful when a ditch has been incorporated. Um, it's difficult when you have a ditch that historically wasn't incorporated to get everyone to agree. There's different types. You can have carrier ditches. You can have um, mutual ditch companies, their advantages to all the different, you know, structures and disadvantages to the different structures. Um, but that's how I would handle it. If, if I couldn't get someone to agree who maybe had, who took their water out upstream and I'm only affecting the ditch below where that takeout is, I think that that would be, that would be an acceptable risk there. Um, but I agree with what Craig said on the laterals is that each ditch is different. And most of the ditches that I represent that are mutualized ditch companies, there's a measuring device for that lateral. And that's where the ditch company's responsibility ends. And then it's whoever is who's off of that lateral below that measuring device. Um, that They have their own easements. They have their own you know, responsibilities on those laterals. So they kind of become their own ditch after that measuring device. But then um, they would still have the right to come in and pipeline, improve, maintain all the normal responsibility or not responsibilities, but privileges, I guess, yeah. are still associated, even though it's a different person now. We had a question also whether or not there are like blueprints for crossings, like what is safe. And again, I think this is based on it's it's different for every ditch. It's a factual question. Um, I represent a big ditch company where they used to allow you to cut into the ditch to make a crossing. And then they decided that they were having, you know, it was creating weakness in the ditch structure. And so now they've gone to only boring agreements. Um, so there, you know, I think that there's information that can be found of what different standards are required. Usually these crossing agreements are recorded. So you can probably go to the county and see, um, searching the clerk and recorder's office for other crossing agreements that will have specifications within them, but it will vary um, based on each ditch, I think. Even yeah, some even of the not, larger, go ahead, Brandon. I was going to say not even within the, the same dish, even again, specific to the uh, the location uh, of the crossing, they can change on ditch companies. But but you're right. Every ditch company does vary. Um, we do encourage the ditch companies at times to try to put together a set of standards at least to provide. I, I think my my dealings with developers and applicants, it works well if you can get in uh, setting forth those standards and specs early in the, into the uh, design process. Uh, the developers are much likely more likely to uh, be amenable to those standards if they're provided them upfront rather than um, when they're too far down the road after they've done a significant amount of design. So the more these ditch companies can uh, have those um, set forth or communicate them via their engineer, all the better. And I think that we also have a new question that's that's kind of similar to that, where if you have a, a new property owner that has gated and locked a property to keep neighbors from getting their getting to their water gates. Um, it, it sounds like it's probably on a lateral and what is the responsibility of the ditch company? I don't know that the ditch company has responsibility to ensure that those lateral owners can get, get to the head gate. I certainly think that they can help play a role in educating and making them understand. But um, if the, the property owner, I think, is now interfering with the reasonable use 
um, of that of that easement, that lateral easement. And so I think again, if the court were to apply that 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 three part test, that they would find that that locked gate, they may be able to gate their property, especially like if they have cows and stuff. We have different rules and responsibilities for different ditch companies on when you can put in fences or cattle guards. They may be able to put a gate in, but there has to be access to be able to get that water. Um, that does make Colorado very different in that state that that is a constitutional right that we've recognized that you have the right to build a ditch across the property of another and to continue to operate and maintain that ditch. Um, so oftentimes, like we said, that's why you get these, these conflicts that are created through people who are not as much familiar with Colorado. Um, the, the last question I think that we haven't addressed as far as what I've reviewed is the MS4 process. And this is something that I'm not as familiar with because typically I'm representing um, ir ditches that are used primarily for irrigation. Um, so they are not required to get discharge permits through the MS4 process. I don't know if Brandon and Craig have had any experience in that area. I have not. However, I know that ditch companies that are predominantly uh, becoming more and more municipal owned, they are nervous about potentially that classification extending to the ditch company. Uh, one of the ditches that goes through Longmont, the oligarchy ditches, ends up being a, a receptacle for most of the city's stormwater. Um, it also de depends on whether or not that ditch, I think the MS4 permit is really intended for uh, storm sewers that then outlet or discharge to lakes, rivers, and streams. Um, not all ditches tail back to a receiving stream. Most do in some manner, uh, but I have not dealt yet with a, a ditch being required, a ditch company to seek an S MS4 permit. Although I know, again, those those companies that are becoming municipal owned um, you know, majority owned, they are nervous about some of that classification extending to the ditch. Uh, I'm just going to jump in. This is Phil. Uh, another question we had kind of went back to an earlier question in, ter in terms of federal land. And I think, Sarah, you said that generally if the ditch uh, existence pre uh, predates the establishment of the federal land, that the ditch's prescriptive easement is is honored and recognized. But what if the ditch is interested in piping part of the ditch uh, and the federal government comes back and says, uh, since you are piping the ditch, we are not going to recognize that prescriptive easement anymore and you're going to have to get a special use permit or some other type of an agreement that could be revocable. Yeah, Sarah, right. I might comment on that real quick. Ahead, I, I, I know Shelly and I know her the basis of her question. So we we have worked on a lot of ditch piping and lining projects that go through BLM and even a little bit of forest service land. And to date, as long as the ditch is not moving or not changing in flow rate or anything of that nature, they have not stood in the way of any of our piping projects. There is one case recently where we were doing a feasibility study at looking at combining two ditches on the same hillside that both had, you know, prescriptive or perpetual easements through BLM. And we looked at merging them into one of the two alignments. And BLM was, is their current stance is that is a significant change to the one easement that's you're going to move them into and therefore you're going to go from a perpetual easement to a renewable special use permit which would be renewed every 30 years and it would have an annual fee associated with it versus the historical perpetual easement is not renewable or i mean it's it's perpetual and there's no fee associated and so that's that's a little bit of a point of contention that I know the owners of that ditch are exploring, but it's it's a nuance that we haven't ran into before. Every other instance where we've crossed the BLM with pipelines or lined canals, we've had to go through the process, but the easement has remained a perpetual easement. Yeah, and you know I've had instances where someone will come in and adjudicate a junior water right and want to run it through the same ditch. Um, and in that case, the senior water right maintains its historical easement 
with the Forest Service, but that junior water right has to operate pursuant to a special use permit. And, and that can even be the case if it's the same owner of those two separate water rights. I have a question about property access where uh, one neighbor, one property owner has gated and locked property to keep the neighbors from accessing their water gates. Um, and I guess that seems to go back to that kind of process of that you talked about relative to kind of a cascade where you start with communication, right? And and then if, if that doesn't work, then you go on to the next steps and, and ultimately you may wind up having to hire a lawyer and litigate that. But is that generally the approach that you have to take there or is there another avenue? Well, I can answer, even though I think I'm supposed to be later in the, in the process. Um, Typically, I'll have someone call me up and say, hey, I have this problem. What should I do? That is what we advise them. You know, go try to talk to that neighbor. Let them understand why you need to get through here. You know, explain to them their rights and responsibilities in being within that other person's property and how they're restricted. We determine whether they have an express easement or a prescriptive easement. Um, but if we can't reach resolution, then we typically do write a letter to the other property owner, letting them know what this is trying to arrange a site visit to come out, take a look at it, have everyone talk about it. Um, but really, if you are the owner of that lateral and you cannot reach your head gate to go and get that water, then you would file you know, for some sort of an injunctive relief with the court. Um, and the court would then determine, you know, and if it's in the middle of irrigation season and you're gonna lose a bunch of crops, you know, then that can be an emergency, to, um, what we would call like a temporary restraining order. It would prevent that property owner from preventing you from getting to your head gate. Um, if it's less of an urgent urgency, the court will take it on a more of a normal course, but you can get a hearing pretty quickly, sometimes within 24 to 48 hours, if it's a, if it's an emergency, and then the court will give you temporary access while the, while the, while the parties then develop their cases. And then the court can make a final decision based on that St. Jude's test of whether or not that underlying landowner can restrict access and to what extent that would be reasonable based on the easement. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Another question is, what is required to dissolve an old ditch company that is no longer in operation? And I do wonder when I read that question as to, um, maybe you should think hard before you dissolve that, because doesn't that also dissolve that prescriptive easement? Mm, that's a that's a good question. Phil, is that a property interest that's held by the ditch company or is it a property interest that follows with the water right? Um, I would say that I would be very hesitant in for many reasons to dissolve um, a, a ditch company um, because it does, it does make most things easier. It allows for a method of organizing people, dealing with potential crossings, collecting, you know, um, assessments or helping to pay for common maintenance items, you know. It, it's just an, it gives you an infrastructure, I guess, in which to operate your ditch company. But if the easement is held by the ditch company, let's say the easy case would be an express easement that was granted to the ditch company, then yes, if you dissolve it, then the ditch company would need to dispose of that property interest. Um, they might be able to convey that interest to the individual water right owners. Um, and maybe something could be done with a prescriptive easement that before the ditch company um, dissolved, it would it would deed its interest, whatever that would be, is kind of a quick claim deed in that easement, um, whether it's prescriptive or deeded uh, to the to the owners of the water right that are going to continue to operate that structure. But so basically, to dissolve, it's like any other company, any other corporation. That when you dissolve it, you have to um, distribute the assets to what would be the members of that ditch company. Those would be the shareholders um, and make sure that all of those property interests have been appropriately um, addressed. Okay, thanks. Hopefully that got to the, uh, the question, the question uh, asker um, to what they were trying to uh, to understand there about that. But um, one other question here that is related to 
main stem, main stem riverbank erosion above the point of diversion and whether a ditch company can be held liable for that erosion. I guess maybe that's a good question for Craig and Brandon. Yeah, so if I understand well, if I, that question, go ahead, Craig. I was, well, I was just going to say, I don't, I haven't ran into an instance that has either explored that or dealt with that. So I don't know, Brandon, if you've got an example or something. I haven't. I was going to mention that, you know, to the extent that that check, uh, you know, those river diversions are primarily exempt for from significant permitting, uh, you know, um, environmental permitting, flood floodplain permitting if they're an existing structure, a longstanding structure. So in that regards, you know, if 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 the if the erosion is occurring simply from the checking and the increase in elevation of the water surface behind it on the upstream banks. Um, I don't think the ditch company would be held liable if if for some reason they're having to check their water up higher than they would reasonably need to because of some lack of ditch maintenance in the ditch or some something like that, then maybe I could see that being uh, a reason why the ditch company might be be liable for that practice, but if it's part of their normal everyday uh, checking of the the main stem to provide head to divert water down their ditch, I, I doubt that they could be held liable for that. And I would think too. I mean, it's going to be something that would have to be. I mean, river banks do erode for many reasons, and trying, you know, there may be a specific case in mind here, but it yeah. would have to be pretty clear cut that it's it's the fault of the operation or presence of the, the structure too that I mean in the very first place that it was just it was it even associated with the head gate because typically like you said they're checking the water they're slowing the water down on the upstream side That's not correct. speeding it up and unless there's some nuance you know with this particular situation but frequently that's the case where you're slowing the water down on the upstream side so there doesn't tend to be increased bank erosion upstream yeah and colorado did pass a new law last year that allows for some of these bank stabilization projects to go forward and to make them easier so it was under um, the term stream restoration um, but and it started as a very broad bill and it was narrowed down to really kind of these bank stabilizations. And so I have seen both conservation districts, different ditch companies kind of come together in order to improve um, the, you know, some of these streams that maybe are have been eroded or are, they don't look like they historically did because of the diversions that come off of them. And so a way that we can help restore some of those files of stream system and still not adversely impact those water right owners. And so I think Colorado is making progress in that regard. And so there's going to be some new tools in the toolbox to deal with instances like that. So a question about the prescriptive easement and whether or not essentially can you lose your prescriptive easement if you do not maintain the ditch for a long period of time or if uh, that maintenance is spotty and irregular and uh, it's not been inspected, or can you lose a portion of a prescriptive ditch easement? And then the, he also asks, you know, should that, can that be reclassified as, as a license? I do think because it's, because it's um, created through adverse possession, I think that there can be an abandonment of that easement. I think the picture that Craig showed of the house that had encroached on it and when he said it would be difficult to go in and um, to have them move that structure, I think that might be an instance where you've that you have you know basically abandoned a portion of that easement because you didn't timely object when someone came and encroached and basically adversely possessed a portion of your easement area. Um, I think that that's why, and and Craig can build on this if he wants to. I I, I think that that's why we say you know go in walk those easements, look for encroachments, and make sure that you address them timely so that your easement isn't being, you know, basically adversely possessed by neighboring property, you know, developments. Yeah, um, and I good. think though to, to, to lose it or reclassify it, I mean, I just, I, I see that as being a hard thing as far as do you have a right to carry the water? Are you still carrying water through the structure? Well, then you still have some rights, but could it be reduced like Sarah was saying, because you allowed some encroachments into it? Yes. 
but is it is it ever going to be gone just you didn't pull trees out so now you can't pull those trees out i, I don't believe that's the case i was going to say something similar again remember that the easement was created for the purpose of conveying water if that water right still exists and has not been abandonment abandoned and you still are using that easement to convey water uh, I think it would be difficult to, um, you know, have someone try to re uh, abandon or relinquish that 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 easement if the if the company is still actively conveying water. Yeah, would you guys agree that it would go more to the scope of how that easement would be interpreted rather than whether or not it exists at all? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, um, you guys have hung with me way past one o'clock and really appreciate it. Um, and a reminder to everyone that we did make a recording of today's webinar and we're gonna post that on agwaternetwork.org along with the highlights of uh, today's presentations as well as the comments and the questions afterwards. So uh, look for that and I'll send out an announcement on that when it's ready. I do also want to just note that there's a couple of upcoming ag water events to be aware of, which you might want to take advantage of in November. One is the DARCA conference. We heard uh, earlier about DARCA. DARCA is having a conference November 8th and 9th. And then also uh, the Colorado Ag Water Alliance is having its annual summit on November 29th and 30th. So a couple of really great water events. Just want to say a special thanks to our presenter, Sarah Dunn, uh, with Balcom Green, Craig Ullman with Applegate Group, and Brandon Eflin with Summit Engineering. Really appreciate uh, the time you guys spent and all the information that you shared. You really made my job incredibly easy. Um, any general comments or questions about today's webinar, please contact me, Phil at BrinkInc.biz, Phil at BrinkInc.biz. And with that, I uh, will say thanks for joining us, and we are concluding this webinar. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.